Being married to a narcissist can leave you feeling like you've got only two choices, resign yourself to a life of misery or pack your bags and leave. But before you make a decision that will change your life forever, I wanna to talk to you about three categories to consider when contemplating a divorce from a narcissistic spouse. With a multitude of twisted scriptures, it can be difficult to determine the most biblical action for your situation. So by the end of our time together, my hope is that you will have greater peace in understanding God's will for your situation and answer the question that I get asked more than any other, will God let me leave my narcissistic spouse? To do that, I wanna break down our time together into three categories, the justified, the baseless, and the plausible. Now this first category is going to be the most important to dive into, but be careful not to assume that you fall into this category as most don't. So the first category is the justified. These are the people who have a justifiable reason to leave a marriage. And the first justification is found in Matthew 19, 9, where it states that we shouldn't divorce except in cases of infidelity. So the first justified reason is where there has been betrayal in the marriage. Now, getting into whether emotional affairs or pornography fall into that category right now is outside of the scope of our time today. But infidelity is a justification for divorce. You're not in the wrong. You're not sinning against God. You're free to leave. You don't have to, but you're free to. And within the church, some not even this, that's where you'll find that the justification stops. So no infidelity, no recourse. But infidelity isn't the only time where God allows for divorce. The next is abandonment. 1 Corinthians 7, 15 states, but if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. And yet another reason that we're gonna talk about for a few minutes is neglect or abuse. Narcissistic relationships are defined by the selfishness of one partner at the expense of another. So instead of using scriptures like God hates divorce as a weapon, perhaps we should acknowledge how much God hates abuse. In fact, that scripture, God hates divorce, was written because the men were abusing their roles and discarding their wives at will. So let's talk about this justification of abuse. Abuse can be defined as extreme danger or harm, emotionally, mentally, or physically. And to tell a victim of abuse that he or she has to stay to be faithful to his or her abuser is further victimizing the innocent. And some may say that no divorce is a hard and fast rule in scripture. And I agree that it should not be abused, but we also find in scripture where there are many cases where the rules are broken. Jesus talking to the woman at the well, healing on the Sabbath, David eating the showbread, rescuing a lost sheep on the Sabbath, instructing Ezekiel to eat unclean food. We even see Abigail going behind her husband Nabal's back because of his destructive behavior, all to save a life. And we have scriptures that appear to contradict themselves, like turn the other cheek, but if they persecute you, flee. And that's because you have to apply godly wisdom, not just applying some unbending law. Telling someone that they have to stay in a toxic, abusive marriage actually condones the abuser and condemns the guiltless. So if there's exceptions in all of these other cases, it would make sense that there's exceptions in the case of marriage abuse as well. My friend, if you are in an abusive situation, I wanna encourage you to go get you and your children to safety, even if it's just temporarily. I think it is evil to further victimize someone in these situations by telling them that they simply need to forgive 70 times seven, turn the other cheek, forgive and forbear. And we need to get better at encouraging those to, in abusive situations to get out of those abusive situations. Now, I'm not saying that we don't forgive. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. But I also wanna to talk to you about the flip side of abuse for just a moment. And this comes with a huge caveat because the majority of the people claiming abuse are not actually being abused. And in doing so, you are making it harder for others who are truly being abused. Most people who simply can't find a way, better way to communicate with their spouse will claim abuse. And most who have checked out of the marriage and don't like how they're being treated will claim abuse. 
Most who have past trauma and can't handle any form of assertiveness will cry abuse. Now, please don't abuse the word abuse. It is a harsh and horrible accusation that is so easily thrown around because it is so difficult to prove. Abuse of the word abuse is when you have a distorted retelling of the story. And I realize that you may believe it, especially if you've told yourself that for a long time. But I do want to challenge you, my friend. How is it that one person can hold their own in an argument while someone else will cower in the corner and claim abuse? Yes, of course, our spouses should be considerate of our feelings, but we must be very careful not to make our past pain someone else's responsibility, because this can create a very toxic dynamic that's now two-sided. However, I can't not address this topic because of some who are going to take advantage of the opportunity to abuse the word abuse. So now that I've got that out of the way, for the sake of our time today, let's assume that we are dealing with real abuse, which is what the narcissists are. They're abusive. And if you're dealing with name calling, threats, constant criticism, and gaslighting, you don't need physical scars to say that situation is abusive. I believe that abuse is a form of breaking the marital covenant. So what do you do? Well, we're going to touch on that in a few minutes. But the next category that is sadly abused by far too many Christians is this. And they're getting their advice from the world and not the Bible. And these are the baseless. And unfortunately, this is the category that many who are entertaining divorce will fall into. And they're not so much looking for biblical solutions as they are just a justification to do what they've already decided in their hearts to do. And sadly, you don't have to search far for people who will encourage you to go live your life with advice like, God would just want you to be happy and God wouldn't want you to be treated that way. And these are actual Christians who will claim irreconcilable differences, which my friend is found nowhere in the Bible. And I've even seen people make up scriptures to suit their narrative. Let's try second justification 215. Hey, if you can't see eye to eye with someone, then just break that covenant and move on. After all, God wants you to be happy. So to think that just because your spouse has narcissistic qualities is a grounds for divorce, I'm sorry, my friend, but that actually would be considered baseless. However, depending on those traits and the severity of them, you could fall into category number three. There is a sliver that will fall into this next category, and that is the plausible. In these cases, maybe one spouse has a really bad temper, but not enough to call the police. Maybe there's one who's severely taking advantage of another. Lines are gray. There's no adultery, but severe flirting. There's no stealing, but maybe one partner is highly irresponsible with money. Maybe the relationship killers have crept into the marriage, things like stonewalling and contempt. And in those cases, separation might be an option. Now, I'm not saying that you should separate. However, there are some cases where one spouse is completely disregarding the needs and well-being of the other. In other words, they seem to be married in title only. There's no partnership. There's no participation. And in these cases, before you jump to divorce, perhaps consider a separation. And this would only be an option after extensive counseling has been pursued. However, separation would be the intent to work both individually and collectively on the marriage while still getting some breathing room. Now, I'm not referring to separation as the world defines it, which simply is just a formality to get a divorce. No, this separation would be with the intent of reconciliation. So if you are at the place of considering divorce, I don't want you to just take the advice of some YouTube video. And many of you have been in a bad situation for a very long time. But if you're being honest, you've contributed to some degree, not saying it's all your fault. And I know you're at a point where you're saying enough is enough. I've tried everything. Now, unless you're in the first category where you need to get yourself to safety, please consider this. Instead of focusing your complaints outward and your pity inward, consider focusing on your personal and spiritual growth while praying fervently for your spouse. 
So what would this actually look like? Well, getting with a good Christian counselor, a pastor, a godly friend to help you work through perhaps the codependency that's keeping you trapped in the relationship, the toxic responses that you're justifying, the inability to stand up for yourself in a godly manner, the negative comments and and thoughts that are consuming your mind. My friend, whatever it is that is going on within you, may I suggest that you apply Psalm 139, 23. Search me, O God and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. No, I am not saying that this is your fault, but think of it like this. If you allow God to do a work in you and this marriage works out, you'll be a better person. If you allow God to do a work in you and this marriage doesn't work out, you'll be a better person. Either way, with God, you win. And this decision should not be taken lightly nor on emotion. And I get it. It's likely been bad for a really long time. And if you are not in harm or danger and there's been no betrayal of the marital vows, may I suggest that you take the steps necessary to lay out your expectations and hopes for the separation and see what the Lord does. Who knows? It could be the very thing that turns them around or it could be the very thing that releases you. But my hope is that you will leave it all in God's hands. My friend, watch what he can do. One thing's for sure that I think we can both agree. If you stay, it can't stay the way it is. And my friend, I pray that God will give you divine wisdom. I pray that your heart will be healed from the hurts of the past. And whether you stay or whether you go, I pray that you will be a shining example of God's grace. Now, I realize topics like this are going to spark some pretty robust debates, and we are certainly open to hearing your point of view, and I just ask kindly that you don't go throwing scripture verses in a negative and nasty manner to try to prove your point. Condemning and critical comments will be deleted, not because it bothers me, but I will not allow you to further victimize someone going through what is likely the most difficult decision of their life. And if you want to do something God honoring, please pray for them. And did you know that extended time with a narcissist can actually open demonic doors in your life? To find out the seven that could be infecting you, go ahead and check out this episode next. And if you've been wondering what type of people pleaser you are, go ahead and take our free people pleaser quiz. I will go ahead and include links in the description section below.